Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining us today in the International English Problem Seminars. You are very happy to have Anna Masukato from Penn State with us today, which, will be, which is working on PDEs with partial focus on elasticity and inverse problems, uh, which will be the focus today. She will be talking about an inverse problem in fault detection. So, so thanks a lot, Anna, for, for, for giving a talk today. So first of all, let me thank Katya and Nut for the kind invitation. It's really a great, great pleasure to give a talk today. And this is joint work with several people, uh, Andrea Aspri um, at the University of Milan in Italy, Elena Beretta, who is at New York University in Abu Dhabi in the United uh, uh, Arab Emirates, and Martin De Hope at the Rice University. And I would like to acknowledge the support of the uh, National Science Foundation on this work. Um, so what I will talk today is uh, actually uh, a, a quite a classical problem uh, that however has uh, received uh, not a lot of attention in the mathematics community and uh, so there are still many opportunities uh, uh, to, to do good work in the area. Uh, so uh, my computer, okay let's see, yes. Okay, so um, so um, I want to start with motivating the problem a little bit uh, before I move on to, to the mathematical discussion. So we want to study folds in the context of seismology. So you can also call them this elastic dislocation, but really in the context of seismology. And we are gonna look at a particular regime, which is that of slow dynamics between seismic events. This is called the interseismic period. So we're not talking about what happens to a fault during an earthquake, or even in the times immediately before and after the earthquakes, but rather what's happening in between uh, uh, earthquakes that can be uh, uh, separated by hundreds, sometimes even thousands of years. And uh, so this is the direct problem, and this uh, will be in the context of linear elasticity, and we can prove that's well posed. Uh, the uh, inverse problems will be, um, uh, on the other hand, the recovery of uh, the fault geometry and how much the rock, the two sides of the rock along the faults have slipped between one another. Uh, from certain type of measurements. And these measurements are displacement measurements at the surface of the earth. So you measure by how much the surface of the earth has changed relative to, uh, to its flat position. Uh, and I will uh, try to motivate why this problem is more relevant now in practical uh, application. So the, this is the inverse problem. And as this community, I really don't have to say this, it's nonlinear and in general, it posed. But we are gonna make a further assumption so that the problem uh, uh, will become, at least from the point of view of the uniqueness, uh, will become well posed. Uh, so the reason why this problem has become uh, relevant again is because now we have uh, very good data on the surface displacement, and that comes from two, two types of uh, uh, data. It's either from global positioning system arrays or also interferometric data from satellite images. So let me uh, show you uh, two pictures. The first one, it's a map uh, of the GPS stations around the world. And you can see that, of course, is not uniformly distributed, but in areas uh, uh, that where we have active faults, for example, in California or uh, in my home country in Italy, uh, you can see that the GPS stations are really uh, very dense. Uh, unfortunately, there are other areas that are very uh, active uh, seismically where we have less GPS data, but we can also use satellite data. And so on the right here, there's a picture in full scope colors that gives you a measure of the strain rate over California and you can see how it correlates so red is high strain blue is low strains and you can see how it kind of follows the San Andreas faults here uh, in a certain months uh, of the year and this is obtained from interferometric data. So, um, so let me start now by discussing the problem uh, mathematically and I want to start with some preliminary. So we are gonna work locally in the Earth's crust. Uh, 
And so the domain for the problem could be either uh, a half uh, uh, space, lower half space, or a bounded domain. We have considered both cases in our work, but for the purpose of this talk, I will concentrate on the case in which we, uh, the domain for the problem is a bounded Lipschitz domain. It's a bounded domain and we take it to be of Lipschitz class in R3. So then how do we model the fault? We model the fault by an open oriented bounded surface S that uh, is at a positive distance from the boundary of the domain, in particular at positive distance from the surface of the earth. So this is the case of buried faults. For example, the San Andreas fault is not buried, it's accessible. And this is in some sense, from the point of view of inverse problems, the more interesting case, because if the fault is directly accessible, you can make direct measurements. Uh, but for example, uh, under the uh, Bosphor Bosphorus Strait in Turkey, there is a very big uh, buried fault um, that uh, uh, the people are trying to monitor. So because of the slow dynamics, we're going to model the Earth's crust as a, uh, um, a, a in the static regime, and we are going to make the assumption, which is a common assumption in seismology, that the, the rock is isotropic uh, and, uh, and uh, has a linear response. So we're going to work in the context of isotropic linear elasticity. However, we are going to assume that the medium is inhomogeneous. So uh, the uh, PVEs that uh, model the forward problem will have variable coefficients. So the elastic behavior is encoded here in the fourth order tensor, which is called the elasticity tensor. And uh, it gives the relationship between the stress which we typically denote by sigma, and the strain, which is the symmetric part of the gradient of u. So what is u here? u is the displacement vector. So if you work in linear elasticity, the deformation can be represented by a vector field, which we call the displacement. In the case of isotropic elasticity, the, uh, the elasticity tensor has a, a somewhat simpler expression. It's still a fourth order tensor. It's written here. I hope you can see my hand, um, the little hand moving. Um, so there's only two parameters, uh, which are called the Lamé uh, uh, parameter or Lamé coefficients, lambda and mu. So uh, uh, we are going to assume that our medium uh, is not only inhomogeneous, but is actually layered. So we are thinking of layers of different rocks with different properties. So we can model that mathematically by assuming that the domain omega is partitioned into a finite sum of subdomains. Um, so that the closure of mega bar is the union of the closure of the sum domains, uh, which are pairwise non-overlapping bounded Lipschitz domains themselves. And we assume that the Lamé coefficients in each subdomain dk is of Lipschitz class uh, as well. We also assume that the Lipschitz constants are uh, satisfy some uniform estimates. I only have finitely many domains, so this will not be a problem. We need, to, for the well-posedness of the forward problem, we need to make further assumption on the Lamé coefficients on the elasticity tensor, and we are going to assume the so-called uniform strong convexity conditions, which is written here. So you assume the, the mu's are bounded away from zero, and three lambda plus two mu is also bounded away from zero. So this guarantees that uh, the uh, 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 operator of linear elasticity, which is a matrix operator, so we're talking about the system of linear PDEs, is the divergence of C applies to the symmetric gradients, and this operator gives rise to an elliptic system. Um, so these are standard assumptions that are very well satisfied by normal materials. So uh, we are going to uh, also assume that the fault surface S is Lipschitz, and remember, it's an open surface that the boundary of S as a surface, it's also of Lipschitz class, and that the surface and the boundary are oriented. So uh, we have to give boundary conditions to be able to study the forward problem, which is uh, what I will discuss first. Um, 
And uh, uh, there are many types of different boundary conditions that you can impose. But uh, uh, remember that we want to model what happens on a patch that is at the surface of the Earth in the Earth's crust. So, a, so we would distinguish two parts of the boundary, a part that is buried, and I will call it capital sigma, and the complement will lie on the surface of the Earth. So we're going to put two types, two different types of boundary condition on the buried and visible part of the surface of the boundary. So on the uh, 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 visible part uh, of the boundary, the part that lies on the surface of the Earth, the physical boundary condition is the so-called traction-free boundary condition. So uh, let me explain what the traction is. The traction is the normal component of the stress. So the stress is given by C applied to the uh, deformation tensor, and then you take the normal component of it. So it gives the force that act on the surface. Because on top of the Earth, there is just air that exercises no elastic force on, on the rock, we can assume that the force is zero. That means that we have no boundary condition on the surface of the Earth. On the buried uh, boundary, we're going to assume for simplicity that we are far away enough from the fault itself that the rock is quiet, and hence there is no displacement. So uh, the rest of the boundary will have uh, homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. Now, uh, other types of boundary condition could be considered. I'll make a comment about this later. So what about the fault? That's really where all the action is. So on the fault S, we assume that it's a fault, that it is not just that the rock has fracture, but that the rock is smooth. The two sides of the rock move relative to each, to, to each other. So the two sides of the fault have slipped. And you can encode this slip uh, by a vector field on S, which represents the jump on the, uh, on the displacement. So we are going to impose the jump of the displacement across the fault. On the other hand, we don't assume that there is any opening of the fault itself, and that means that the traction should be continuous. So we have continuity of the traction, but jump in the displacement. So let me, I'll give you a cartoon of our setup for the direct problem uh, and also for the forward problem. So my omega is this box here. Uh, and inside we will have different layers of rock. So in each layer, the uh, uh, elastic uh, coefficient varies, but they are regular, they're Lipschitz, but may jump across uh, the layers. S is uh, the faults, and notice the faults can cross, is allowed to cross different layers. And the surface of the Earth is the top part, and the sigma, the buried part, is the blue. So we impose no displacement uh, on the blue part and no traction at the top. And so what is this capital theta here? Well, the capital theta will be the so-called acquisition surface for the inverse problem. That is where we are going to uh, uh, in measure things. And so this will be a patch on the top side, on the, on the visible part of the, of the surface. And as I said, the S can cross several layers. So the direct problem is a classical problem, but as I said, it has really not been studied rigorously very well. Um, so we, the, the right problem is as follows. You want to find U, the displacement, solution of the boundary value interface problem, which goes as follows. So you solve the uh, system of linear elasticity in the complement of the fault. Uh, you have zero traction on the visible part of the surface. You have zero displacement on the buried part. And then you impose the jump on the displacement. This will be the slip. Uh, how much the, the rock has slipped on the faults, and you impose that the jump of the traction is zero on the fault. So the jumps here are determined in terms of non tangential limits on each side of the fault. So the data for the direct problem is the Lamy tensor C, the fault surface S, and the jump in the displacement, which is also called the Borger's vector. So as I said, other condition can be considered on the buried part. So you could consider traction free or for numerical methods, oftentimes absorbing boundary condition have been imposed. <laughs> 
So uh, let me discuss a little bit more about the Burgers vector, vector. And let me tell you that although you have this idea that the rock has slid, G can be oriented in any direction and S can be oriented also in any direction. So uh, it could be tangential uh, to the fault itself. This is called a strike sleep fault. So it could be normal to the fault. This is called a deep sleep fault, or it could be oblique. And so here, for example, I have taken two pictures from one from Wikipedia and the other one from this beautiful uh, uh, NASA site called Earth's Observatory uh, of a strike sleep and a deep sleep fault. Of course, these are not buried, but just for to give you an idea what, what these represent. Now, in general, not the entire fault is active, but only a patch of it is active. And so we are going to call the portion of the fault where G is not zero a dislocation patch. Oops. So let me uh, discuss what's known about the forward problem and also about the inverse problem. And not a lot has been was known until recently. So this is a very classical work. In fact, Volterra, Vito Volterra worked uh, on, uh, on this location at the turn of the last century, but always in a very um, simplified setting. So, uh, so the, the domain was a homogeneous half space. You assume that the Burgers factor is constant. These are called Volterra dislocations, in fact. And this is a very simple geometry. For example, typically a rectangle with small angle. By small angle, I mean less than pi over two with respect to the uh, uh, normal direction. In this context, then you can solve the problem, the forward problem explicitly, because you can write the formula for the solution as a double layer potential in terms of the Green's function for the problem. Uh, so this was done, okay, Volterra studied these problems uh, using uh, more classical techniques, but um, uh, in the 90s, Okada derived an explicit formula for the solution using the so-called Mindlin function, which is the Green's function for the homogeneous problem in a half space. However, we want to vastly generalize this setting. Uh, let me say that uh, if the Burgess vector is not constant, then you talk about Somigliana dislocations. So until recently, there wasn't much work, but, uh, 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 but recently there has been some improvement. So in particular, Darko Volkov and collaborators, uh, UNESCO, Voisin, and Tricky have done uh, significant work uh, on the well-posedness and even on the inverse problems in the classical framework. So they still work with homogeneous, uh, uh, um, with a homogeneous half space, but they take a general fold and uh, they take uh, the slip vector in the variational space. So if we want to have H1, then when we take the trace onto the fault, we should land in H1 half. Now there is uh, some, uh, um, you have to be uh, a little careful here because S is not a closed surface. And so in fact, you have to work with the subset of H1 half of S. I will explain in more detail later. And in the work, in our work, uh, in particular in a paper that has appeared in Archive for Rational Mechanics, um, we have studied the problem uh, uh, in a half space. <coughs> Excuse me as well. <coughs> Excuse me, let me drink a, a sip of water. But for Lipschitz coefficients and a general uh, fault S, and we, we were able to take the Borges vector in the entire variation of space, H1F of S, and that requires the use of weights. So I will explain why. So uh, if we want to work in the variational framework, that is, if we really want to have uh, the solution to be in the subless space H1, for example, for numerical uh, reason and for many other reasons, then there's some difficulty if you take the Borgers factor G, the jump in the displacement, in just in H1 half, in the fractional subless space H1 half of S. And the reason is that if the support of G is the entire a closure of the fault S and G is an arbitrary vector in H1 half, then the solution may develop singularities along the border of the faults. And that not only puts you outside of the variational framework, but it's also unfeasible 
okay? The displacement should not become infinite because for one thing, you will be completely outside of the linear approximation in elasticity if that happens. So one way to remedy that, that is still physically motivated is to say the following. In application, as I mentioned already, only a patch on the fault is active at one time. And that means that in reality, the support of the uh, slip vector G is really a compact subset of S. But for the inverse problem, we really need the support of G to be the closure of the fold. If it's not, you simply do not uh, determine the, uh, the places where G is not zero. So one way to remedy that is to work in a proper subset of uh, H1 half of S, which is uh, usually uh, denoted by H1 half zero zero. And we follow here the definition in Leons and Magenes. So this is the uh, the space the subspace of the closure of h1 hat of uh, uh, s infinity's um, a complex support function uh sorry this should be s not d uh, uh, that have the additional property that uh, uh, they vanish at the boundary what does that mean that they vanish at the boundary that if you introduce a weight uh, which is the distance uh, to the boundary of S uh, to the uh, uh, one half, then delta to the minus one half that you should be in L2. So this is a weighted subless space. Uh, it's, uh, it's norm with the natural norm, and it's a closed subspace of H one half. So why do we work with this space? Because you can prove that the extension by zero is then a, a bounded operator from H1 half zero zero of S to H1 half of any uh, uh, extension of the surface S. So we assume here uh, that we can close the fault S into a closed Lipschitz surface gamma in omega, bounded away from, from its boundary. And then we can forget about the fact that S is an open surface and simply work on gamma, a closed Lipschitz surface. This is the classical setting for an uh, interface problem uh, uh, by replacing the uh, uh, jump in the displacement G with its extension by zero. So in the following, uh, we will forget about S and always work with the gamma and use this extension G tilde. So then I'm going to weak, uh, seek a weak solution of the following more standard uh, transmission problems uh, uh, in a suitable space. So in a suitable dual of the space H1, a function that vanish on uh, the, that satisfy the homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. So we want to study this problem. And again, this is a classical transmission problem, except that it doesn't satisfy the standard transmission conditions because the jump across S is not zero. So, uh, uh, so the way that we uh, are going to uh, uh, study this problem, uh, well, first of all, we're going to prove well poseness. So what we can prove is the following theorem that there exists a unique weak solution and it lands into the good space, right? So it is in H1 on the complement of the closure of the fault. So this is the best you can hope for with H1 half data on the fault. And of course, it satisfies the Dirichlet boundary condition. Variationally, the traction free condition are automatically imposed and it satisfies our dislocation initial, uh, uh, boundary uh, interface problem. So uh, not only we have uniqueness and existence, but we can also prove uh, stability. And stability simply follows from the proof of this theorem. Now, the proof does use the interface gamma, that is the closure of S onto a closed Lipschitz surface, but I stated it in terms of S only because, in fact, the solution is independent of the choice of gamma. So we are going to solve a more classical interface problem, but in the end, uh, it's independence, independence on how we close the surface S. Uh, so the stability follows from the proof, and an alternative proof uh, used directly lux milgram, but you need to, to uh, fix the fact that you have a non-zero jump by a suitable lift. 
Uh, I'm, I'm thinking here of the work of Ladizhenskaya and Solonikov, for example. And let me say that for the forward problem, you don't need C to be isotropic. C can be any anisotropic tensor, and, and you also don't need it to be Lipschitz or piecewise Lipschitz. L infinity is enough, but we need the more stringent condition for the inverse problem. Uh, now, we couldn't find the proof of uh, the world poseness for this problem, so we proved it, okay? But the proof is, uh, in some sense, somewhat standard. Um, uh, and we follow Agranovich here, and we uh, prove the existence by solving two auxiliary problems. So let me first uh, briefly give you a sketch of the proof. So first of all, we divided the problem into two parts. So once we close S into gamma, okay, we have two disconnected part. The outside part, we're gonna call it omega plus and the, uh, uh, the interior part, we're gonna uh, call it omega minus. And then will be the outer norma to omega minus. And we're gonna use the following standard results that uh, uh, my a function that is in H1 on each side and such that the jump is zero across the interfaces in H1 on the entire domain. So here, uh, we will not have that the jump is zero on the entire gamma, but we will have that the jump is zero on gamma minus s. So my solution will be exactly H1 on the complement of s. Uniqueness is completely standard. This is a, a, a linear problem. So let me just uh, uh, show you quickly the existence. So as I said, we consider two auxiliary problem in omega plus and omega minus, and we're gonna choose some suitable matching condition to get the right solution in the entire domain. So the auxiliary problems are as follows. In omega minus, we are gonna solve a uh, a, a Neumann uh, a boundary problem for the elasticity uh, uh, equation. And on omega plus, we are gonna solve a mixed boundary value problem because of course we want to match the right boundary condition on the boundary of omega. And they are matched, they are coupled through a density which gives the value of the trace of the traction on each side of the interface gamma. Of course, there are some normalization issues to get uniqueness. Let, let me not uh, dwell on that. Uh, the issue is now that we want to choose phi so that the combination of the solution of the two auxiliary problem is solution of the original problem. And uh, the way that we choose phi then is to use the Neumann to Dirichlet operator on each side and uh, uh, um, apply to the uh, Borges vector. Uh, and so now we have phi and we, you can prove that with this choice of phi's, you define like this, you minus in omega minus and you plus in omega plus solution of these two problems is a weak solution of the original problem. So uh, this is for the direct problem. Let me talk about the inverse problem, which is really uh, what I'm more interested in. So again, we want to identify first and then reconstruct, but today I will only discuss about the uniqueness question, both the fault geometry, that is the surface S and the slip vector G from boundary displacement measurements made at the surface of the earth on this patch, which I call capital theta. Now, I will discuss only the case of isotropic elasticity because we are going to use unique continuation to do that. However, we have recently extended this work to the anisotropic case under additional condition on the coefficients. So for example, using results of Nakamura and collaborators, you can uh, take C to be orthotropic into space dimensions, for example. Uh, but for simplicity, I'm still assuming here the C is isotropic. So it's the Lame tensor. And uh, we're going to assign the data on an open subset capital theta of the visible part of the, of the boundary, the surface of the Earth. And uh, we are going to assume that we, are, we only have one measurement on theta. What does that mean? OK, well, theta is an open subset, so literally is infinitely many measurements, but it's one function. So I need to specify only one function on theta to get uniqueness. So uh, I will only deal with the uniqueness question. Let me say that in the work of Volkov and collaborators is also uh, consider some reconstructions algorithm for the case of a planar fault. 
Now we need to assume geometric condition on S. So in general, we do not, we cannot prove uniqueness in generality, and maybe unique, uniqueness doesn't even hold in generality, but it does hold if you assume uh, that as uh, 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 satisfy some geometric constraints. One example could be polyhedral surfaces that have no common faces. So this, for example, would be the setting useful for numerical applications. I'll have some pictures in a couple of slides. So let me remind you again of the geometric setup. Okay, so we measure on theta and we want to find S and the slip G across S knowing all the uh, coefficient. Uh, my computer is misbehaving, sorry. Uh, and as I said, this theta, it's an open patch on the top side, which is the Earth's surface. So this is our main uh, uniqueness result. Okay, suppose by, con of course, we're gonna do a proof by contradiction. So let's suppose that we have two potentially different uh, uh, fault surfaces. So these are open bounded Lipschitz surfaces, uh, but we need to assume that they are graphed with respect to the same coordinate system. The coordinate system doesn't have to be uh, in a particular direction. For example, S1 and S2 could be vertical, horizontal, or oblique, but they have to be graphed with respect to the same coordinate system. And uh, we take uh, uh, our uh, Burgess vector G to be in our variational space and also bounded for simplicity. Uh, and uh, we are going to assume that the two folds are exactly the active part of the fault. That is the support of the uh, slip vector is exactly equal to the closure of S. Then uh, let's call UI this unique solution of the four problems for each of the two set up with uh, uh, so faults S1 and S2 and slip vector G1 and G2. And if you want and you to agree on the acquisition manifold theta, then necessarily S1 and S2 are the same and G1 and G2 are also the same. So example of surfaces that will work well here are unions of rectangles, either oblique or vertical or even horizontal. So if you think about what a, soul, a fault looks like, well, thinking of unions of rectangle or something that look like that, uh, uh, it's not too restrictive. In the picture of the fault that I gave you at the beginning of the talk, they do look like graph with respect to the same coordinate system. However, uh, it's still open uh, uh, what happens if you take away this geometric condition. For example, smooth surfaces are not covered. And I really don't know whether I suspect there is no uniqueness in, in the smooth category, but I do not have an example. So here is a sketch of the proof. So again, we're going to do a, a proof by contradiction using unique continuation uh, results. So uh, let me call W the difference between U1 and U2. So W is defined, of course, in omega uh, minus the union of the two, uh, the closure of the union of the two uh, surfaces. So I'm assuming that S1 and S2 are different here, and I'm going to reach a contradiction. So what does W uh, solve? Okay, so W um, solve the elasticity uh, equation in uh, uh, this domain, and it has zero Cauchy data on the acquisition manifold. Okay, so W restricted to theta is zero, and the traction restricted to theta is also zero. So using the uniqueness for the Cauchy problems, we follow here the work of Morassi and Rosset, and unique continuation results for the Lame system, in particular work of Lin Nakamura and Wang, then we can conclude that W, the difference between U1 and U2 is zero, in the entire connected component of the domain, which is omega minus the union of the folds. Uh, and uh, 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 of course, the connected components that contains the acquisition manifold, of course, that is the boundary of G should contain theta. Now, uh, you can conclude from here because the disconnected component may not be the entire domain. I'll show you a picture. So we distinguish two cases. The case, the first case is the simpler, and it's the case in which the complement of the union or the closure of the union of two uh, folds uh, is path connected, and the other one is where it's not path connected. 
And there are no other cases because we are assuming that S1 and S2 are graphed with respect to the same coordinate system. So in particular, they have no common faces. That means that they must intersect along a lower dimensional set. So um, I'll show you a picture in the next slides. We are gonna uh, begin with the case I, which is simpler than the first case. In fact, in this case, by unique continuation, W is uh, uh, the entire uh, um, an entire neighborhood of the union of the two surfaces accessible from theta, and we know that W is zero there. So therefore, the jump of W across uh, the uh, union of the two surfaces must be zero as well. So let me show you two pictures. Okay, so this is the case, an example of case uh, uh, one. So we have the two surfaces that uh, uh, intersect al along uh, um, this line here. And you see the complement of the union of the purple and orange is directly accessible from anywhere uh, uh, on the boundary of the domain. So this is the first case. The other case is uh, the case in, in, where, on the other hand, uh, the two surfaces kind of shield the part of the domain from the boundary. So, uh, you know, so in, in the, pack, the picture on the right, uh, uh, I have the problem that I kind of need to be able to get into this, uh, this sphere here, uh, which is created by putting S1 and S2 together. So, but let's continue with case one, okay? So as I said, by contradiction, we are assuming that S1 is different than S2. That means there exists a point Y on S1 that's not on S2. But because of the assumption that we have made on, uh, we are still in case I, that also means that there exists a small ball centered at Y that does not intersect the other surfaces. So that means that the W on the, uh, uh, on the intersection of this ball with S1 has to agree with U1. And that means that the jump in W, which is equal to the jump in U1, is equal to G1. But we just said that the jump is zero, so we need to have that G1 is zero. And this is a contradiction since we are assuming that the support of G1 is exactly the closure of S1. Of course, by repeating the same arguments, which in the role of S1 and S2, we conclude that there cannot be a point on one of the surfaces that doesn't belong to the other. So that means that the two surfaces have to agree. And then the condition on the jumps easily gives you that the slip factors have to be the same. So this concludes the uniqueness in case one. What about case two? Well, case two, uh, there is a part of the uh, complement uh, in omega of the union of two surfaces that's not accessible from the acquisition manifold, from the boundary, in fact. Without loss of generality, I can assume there is only one such component. Uh, let me call it D. So in the, in the picture I showed before, it would be the ball with boundary S1 and S2 on the picture on the right. So I can also assume without loss of generality, because if that's not what, if what I'm about to say is not true, then it's covered by the previous cases. I can also assume that the boundary of this connected component is exactly the union of the two closed surfaces. So we are exactly in the case of the picture, which I show you on the right, which I show you uh, before. Now, the problem is that we can say the W is zero by unique continuation on the out, outside of D, but we have to find a way to move inside D. So from the interface and boundary condition, I uh, have the following, however, if I call W minus, minus for interior, the uh, uh, W, which is the difference between U1 and U2 restricted to this connected component, then it satisfied the following. Of course, it satisfied the homogeneous um, linear elasticity equation. And it also has uh, 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 zero values of the traction. Because remember that the traction does not jump. Okay, so if it's zero outside, it will be zero inside. However, I know nothing about the value of W, the trace of W on the boundary of D. So I cannot conclude that W is zero. Uh, from this homogeneous Norman problem, however, I can conclude that W minus uh, is an infinitesimal rigid motion. 
So if I can exclude infinitesimal rigid motions, which are the kernel of the elasticity operator, then I can conclude that W minus is zero. That means W is zero, that means U1 equal to U2, and that will force S1 and S2 to be the same, and G1 and G2 to be the same. So our goal now is to conclude that W minus is, uh, 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 which is an infinitesimal rigid motion can only be the trivial rigid motion that is zero. So what is an infinitesimal rigid motion? Well, it's a linear transformation, which, uh, well, it's an affine transformation, which is translation plus uh, uh, the action of a skew-symmetric matrix, okay? So I have to use the fact that I know what W is outside of D and that I have transmission condition for U1 and U2. So first of all, by unique continuation, if I call W plus W restricted to the complement of D, this is what I get from the boundary, I know that is zero. So that means that the jump of W across uh, the boundary of the connected component is in fact equal to the value of W minus. I don't know what that is, but I know that that's that trace. However, remember that W is equal to U1 minus U2. So on S1, the jump in W has to be equal to the jump in U1 because U2 doesn't jump across S1. I'm assuming an S1 and S2 are different, right? While on S2 is the opposite. So in other words, I know that the jump of W on S1 is G1 and then jump of uh, W on S2 is G2. And from there, I want to obtain a contradiction unless A and C are zero, which means that W minus is zero, which means that W is zero. So how do I do that? Well, I observe that, um, uh, uh, that uh, the, remember that we are assuming that the boundary of D, the, the, the shielded component of, of the domain is exactly the union of the two folds. And uh, they have to therefore uh, match uh, along a curve on the boundary of these connected components. But uh, uh, this curve is a closed curve. So keep that in mind. Like in the picture I showed you, it was the circle that matched the two, the upper hemisphere that was S1 and the lower hemisphere that was S2. Remember that the two Borges vectors GI are assumed to be in this uh, subspace of H1 half, H1 half zero, zero. And this is the space such that at the boundary of S, which is a curve, and it's exactly this curve C in this setup, they have to vanish. So in other words, W minus is zero along C, which is the curve that glue S1 and S2 together. And this is a contradiction because if you are in infinitesimal uh, uh, um, rigid motion, you are a linear transformation, your kernel can only be a line and not a closed curve. And so therefore the only way that we can have that is if W minus is zero and uh, in D and hence W is zero. And therefore by the uniqueness of the solution, everything has to match. So, um, so this is our uniqueness result. As I said, it can be extended in various ways, but what about the reconstruction? Well, that's what we are working on right now. And uh, our first uh, uh, idea is to try to use an iterative algorithm based on a shape derivative. So I want to spend uh, the last say five minutes or so discussing a little bit about that. So uh, we are gonna derive a uh, distributed shape derivative, distributive because we live inside the domain. And what does the shape derivative measure? It measures the changes in the solution U, the displacement of the forward problem under infinitesimal movement of the fault S and the slip G. Then the idea of this iterative algorithm is that you're gonna start with a guess of where the fault is, and this is true in many situations, you have an idea where S is gonna be located and what's already the, the movement of the rocks from say historical data. And then you're gonna use a steepest descent type algorithm using the shape derivative to, uh, to try to converge to the actual fault and slip factor. So how do we compute the shape derivative? 
Uh, the computation is involved, but in, in some sense standard in this uh, in this business. So uh, first of all, we are going to model the infinitesimal movements with the linear transformation identity plus uh, uh, a small parameter t times a uh, uh, a smooth map, capital U, uh, uh, and we can assume that the movement, since t will be relatively small, then uh, this movement is, uh, happens only close to the current location of the fold. That is, we assume that sup, uh, the support of U uh, is uh, compact and is uh, bounded away from the boundary of uh, omega, okay? Uh, so we're going to call S of T the image of S under phi T, and GT uh, is going to be uh, the change uh, in the, uh, um, in the uh, slip factor. So we are going to consider the derivative both with, with respect to a geometric change of the fold and a perturbation of the slip factor. So now I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna study how the solution of the four problem, which I'm gonna call ut. So here t is just a parameter, it's not time, uh, which correspond to the fault s and the sleep h, or if you want g, uh, changes with t. So this will allow us to derive the so-called material derivative. The material derivative u dot, which is not yet the shape derivative, is the change in the solution uh, uh, at time at, at t equals zero. So it's the initial change of the solution due to the fact that, that S has become S of T and G has become G of T. And we are gonna derive it as a solution of a certain variational problem. So then we are gonna utilize the material derivative U dot to compute the shape derivative. So what is the shape derivative? The shape derivative will give the change of a certain functional. So it will be the derivative of a certain functional, which is a misfit functional on the boundary. So let me call U of M the measured data on the acquisition manifold. And let me call J of T, my mis misfit functional, to be the L2 norm square, okay, with one half just for, the, for convenience, between the actual solution and the measured data on the acquisition manifold theta. So we want to study the derivative of this function. That's what the shape derivative will be. So What's, uh, what, we, what, what we have is that the derivative of j with respect to the parameter t at t equals zero, the shape derivative, and it will be distributed because it will be written as an integral in the interior of the domain, not on the boundary, uh, is given by the following formula. So, um, so here, capital U, uh, lit, um, bold U is the solution of the dislocation problem with the full surface S and the slip vector G. So the actual surface and the, the actual vector, uh, slip vector G. And W, okay, so uh, U is paired with W in some sort of variational form, um, satisfy the adjoint problem. So uh, W will satisfy uh, the elasticity, the homogeneous elasticity system. It will be zero, it satisfy, of course, the, uh, the homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition as U, uh, uh, and the traction uh, on the uh, top part of the boundary will be given in terms of the mis misfit values, okay? So if I can find U, uh, sorry, if I can find W, then uh, it, I have a, a way to compute uh, this shape derivative by solving a formal problem for you. And here D of U is the derivative map of, of, of U, of capital U. So, uh, so let me finish uh, with the saying uh, what uh, the current and some future work. So first of all, it would be nice to have uh, uh, a stability estimate and in fact, a quantitative stability estimate for the inverse problem, but perhaps making further assumption on the geometry of the problem and on the data. Uh, for example, for cracks, uh, uh, if you uh, assume uh, if, if you assume that uh, that they are polyhedral, for example, uh, then you can prove uh, a better stability than what you expect for the general crack problem. 
Uh, as I said, we are working towards uh, a, a iterative reconstruction algorithm based on the shape derivative. Uh, now, if C is more regular, that is, if it's not piecewise Lipschitz, but if it says it's uh, C1 or C2, then you can also uh, obtain a boundary shape derivative. Uh, uh, but we're going to use uh, the distributed shape derivative and uh, use a discontinuous Galorgi methods for the forward problem. Uh, this is uh, joint work with Paolo Antonietti in Polytechnical in Milan. It would be uh, very nice to start to look at the time dependent problem. And here by time dependent, I mean initially just uh, the time harmonic problem, that is the elastic Helmholtz. Uh, um, uh, problem at non-zero frequencies and uh, of course the dependence of the frequencies how the reconstruction depends on the frequencies uh, is a very important problem uh, i am uh, uh, referencing here the recent uh, beautiful work by gunther uh, by ullman and wang for the calderon problem uh, uh, of course this is probably quite involved so it's not clear but this is certainly something that it's interesting to look at uh, uh, for, for a more application point of view, we should really look at uh, more uh, realistic models on the fold. So uh, in reality, uh, uh, you want to include some dynamic of the fold. Uh, and the simplest way to do this is to use friction models, both linear or nonlinear. So that assumes that the fold is itself uh, a layer of a viscoelastic material. So I'm aware uh, that UNESCO world, for example, have looked at models like that. And for the simplest model uh, of linear friction, you assume that the tangential stress on the fault is proportional to G. So you're gonna have an equation now for G on the fault. You will not impose G in the forward problem. And obviously, uh, it would be very nice to also look at the truly time dependent problem, for example, dynamic faults rupture models. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot, Anna, for a, for a great talk. So, uh, um, uh, if you have questions, please, uh, please feel uh, free to unmute yourself uh, and ask questions. So, Sonia, you mentioned the, the time the dynamic problem, but I also was wondering, so say that you are wanting to monitor for changes in the fault, would that sort of the, the shape derivative be useful to, to detect sort of changes in the fault? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I have a student uh, that's looking now at uh, still the um, quasi-static uh, approximation. So we're still solving the linear uh, 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 elastostatic problem, but now the data depends on time. And if you just assume that the slip vector depends on time, then the problem is very simple because the even the inverse problem, because it's linear in G. But it becomes more interesting now to allow the fault uh, to change in time. And uh, she's looking at various ways to address this problem. And one, of course, is to use the shape derivative. Uh, well, in fact, the material derivative. Yeah, so, um, so she's working on that. That would be step zero in trying to do more realistic model. And then I would like for her to look at this uh, linear friction model. Uh, so, so there you're gonna have basically no DE for, well, it's an integral differential equation for G on the fold. Uh, so G is not specified. So already the direct problem, uh, there are some, there, there's some work, but not a lot already on the direct problem. Mm -hmm. So, so here, here you looked at sort of um, um, a finite uh, domain. Is it very different if you have a half space? Yes, exactly. Yeah, right. Yes. So our original, uh, our first paper in archive uh, for rational mechanics is in half space, um, and uh, uh, so there are two difficulty in that work one is it's an unbounded domain so you have to uh use weights at infinity you know to to, to control the growth of of the solution but we also take g 
to be uh, uh, not to vanish at the tip of s okay so so g uh, which however so mathematically is a more general result but physically is not so clear in some sense you would expect that the displacement should vanish if at the at the at the boundary of the active patch but we we assume no so there is a jump so there is a discontinuity potentially right in the displacement even at the boundary of the fold and in that case you have to use weights even around the fold and once you do that you do not have a variational problem because you are not in h1 anymore on the complement of the fold and uh, so for that reason, we can only do it for Lipschitz coefficient because we have to turn it, turn it into a source problem. Mm -hmm. And we need regularity to be able to, to do a singular source problem by duality. So we don't know how to do it if for less regular data because we have to have regularity and duality basically. That doesn't mean it's not possible. It's just it seemed to us that because physically the seismology is always assumed that there is just a, an active patch, that the and also for numerical purposes that it was better to to make a, a st st more stringent assumption on on G, but but deal with the less regular uh, Lamy coefficients. Thanks. Any, any other questions for, for Anna? Well, uh, there are no other questions. Thanks a lot again for a great talk. It's a really nice uh, perspective, both on the physical problem as well as nice analysis. It's very, very, very nice talk. Thanks, Thank you Anna. very much. Thank you again for the opportunity. It's a great